All right, so today we're going to cover chapter 18, which is all about free energy and thermodynamics. So again, thermodynamics is related to chapter 6, which is thermochemistry, right? And thermochemistry is a small field of, or subfield of thermodynamics, which is all about um, the transfer of energy from one object to another or the conversion of energy from one form to another. All right, so this is basically the outline of today's lecture. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover all nine uh, bullet points here, so I'm just going to cover the first five, and then the second half will be on Thursday. So first off, we'll talk about the four laws, or there's actually a total of four laws of thermodynamics, but we will only uh, cover the first two because the last, the second half is kind of uh, advanced. It's only usually covered uh, in the junior year or senior level uh, undergraduate. And then we'll talk about the concept of heat tax, right? So um, nature will take a little bit of energy from every process, right? A little bit of tax from each transition from one uh, energy to another, from one object to another. So it's kind of like the government, right? Every time you get paid, you'll take a little bit of your money uh, it's a similar way. All right, so, um, and then we'll cover spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes and uh, differentiate the two. We'll also talk about the concept of entropy and how that's related to the second law of thermodynamics. And finally, how to quantify delta S, which is the changes in entropy. All right, so just a quick recap of chapter six regarding thermochemistry. So uh, we have a system, and a system is basically defined as the one that you're studying, right? For example, a chemical reaction is itself a system. Anything outside that uh, reaction, outside that system, is considered surroundings, right? So for example, if you're reacting um, an acid in the base, right, via neutralization reaction, the solvent itself, water, is considered the surrounding, right? It's not part of the system because it's not part of the reaction. It's not uh, involved in the chemical reaction. It's just between the acid and the base. All right, so anything, any energy that comes into the system is considered an endothermic process, right? So you give it a positive sign because it's entering the system. And anything that comes out of the system will be considered uh, an exothermic process. So it receives a negative sign. All right, so um, again, water, right, in that neutralization reaction, water is an example of a surrounding. Uh, the reaction flask itself is also uh, surrounding. The bench, the air surrounding the reaction, those are all examples of surrounding. All right, so according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So this is related to the law of conservation of energy, right? Energy is conserved. Um, so any thermodynamic processes are subject to the law of conservation of energy, okay? So for example, you uh, walk into your car, you turn the engine on, and as soon as you turn that engine on, it'll start running, right? It'll start burning fuel. So that burning of fuel is an example of a chemical reaction. It's a combustion reaction. So when the fuel burns, pressure is released, and then it pushes that piston up, right, within the cylinders. And so that chemical process right there, that chemical reaction, is performing work on the car. And that's what helps propel the car, okay? But aside from the work that's done by the chemical system or the chemical reaction, there's also heat that's generated from that combustion reaction. So the work done by the system plus the heat that was generated equals the total energy. So in that process, energy is conserved. All right, energy tax. 
And this is related to the second law of thermodynamics, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides. But every energy transition results in a loss of energy. So every step that you take causes a loss of energy. Right? So for example, let's say you're trying to get into um, uh, from one state to another, right? final and initial states. The number of steps that you take to get to that stage um, or the amount of energy that's lost will depend on how many steps you take to get to that stage. All right, so the more steps you take, the more energy will be lost. Okay, so this is the energy tax that's demanded by nature and the conversion of energy to heat, which is lost by heating up the surroundings. So the heat that's lost basically goes towards nature, which is surroundings. So here's an example. Let's say you're recharging your phone, right? And you plug it into the wall. Energy gets transferred, right? Electrical energy from the outlet to your phone. So let's say 100 kilojoules of useful energy gets into your phone. That will actually require more than 100 kilojoules of energy. The reason why is because you're transferring it from the outlet to your phone. And so that transferring process um, loses energy in the form of heat. So that's why uh, over time, whenever you're recharging your phone, your phone feels a little bit hot, right? And also the cord itself gets hot. It's because you're losing energy as you recharge your uh, phone. All right, do you guys have any questions regarding this slide? First law of thermodynamics and energy tax. All right. So here's another example. Let's say we're trying to heat a room in a house or the entire house via two methods. First method is using natural gas. And the second method is using electricity. Which one do you think is more efficient? Would be natural gas. The reason why is because it only takes a single step to generate heat, right? So you burn the gas, you get heat, and you basically heat the entire uh, house. But with electricity, it'll take several steps, right? It, it stems from the burning of the fossil fuel, and this basically heats up water, turns into steam, and then that turns on a turbine that generates electricity, and that electricity gets transmitted to your home. So every step that it takes loses energy. Okay, so that's why this process is very inefficient. So a lot of the researchers, uh, not just in the university level, but also in the industrial level, um, they're always trying to find a more efficient way to you know, deliver uh, elect electricity to your home. So uh, let's switch gears here and talk about spontaneity right, and thermodynamics. So thermodynamics right, basically helps you predict whether a process is going to occur under given con conditions. So this means that if you have a spontaneous process, that means it will happen without the input of energy. Right? It'll just go. Right? So let's say you're riding a bike on uh, a decline. You don't need to put too much energy, you just slide, right? But going the opposite direction on an incline, that requires a lot of energy. So that would be a non-spontaneous process. Any process that requires additional energy or input of energy to occur. All right, so spontaneity is determined by comparing the chemical potential of the reactants and the products. So for example, if, um, if I don't know if you guys remember this from chapter 14 regarding chemical kinetics. So uh, we have here a graph, right, energy diagram. Over here we have reactants. And below it, we have products. Right? And then right in between it is the hump. Right? So 
According to the second bullet point here, spontaneity is determined by comparing the chemical potential energy of the reactants and products. And so if the products have lower potential energy than the reactants, then you will have a spontaneous process or a spontaneous reaction because it doesn't require additional energy, right? You're coming from a high energy level to a lower energy level. So that transition does not require energy. So in that case, a forward direction, a forward reaction, for this specific example, will be spontaneous, okay? Does not require energy. But going the opposite direction, right? Reverse reaction will require energy. So this reverse reaction here will be considered non-spontaneous because it requires an input of energy. Are all of these considered exothermic? Can, like for example, for the spontaneous and non-spontaneous case, are they both always exothermic? Or so most endothermic? most exothermic processes um, are spontaneous, but as we will see later on, there's actually some endothermic processes that are also uh, spontaneous. Okay. So, um, right, so the forward reaction here is an exothermic process, right, because you have an, a release of energy. So this change in energy here, it's called delta H of reaction. Right? So you guys remember that. This is the enthalpy of reaction. All right, so spontaneity is not the same as the speed of a chemical reaction. Right? It's not the same as chemical kinetics. But the spontaneous reaction may be either slow or fast. Okay. So an example is the decay of uranium into lead. Right? The nuclear decay is a spontaneous reaction or spontaneous process, except it'll take billions of years before uranium turns into lead. Catalysts only affect the rate of the reaction and not the spontaneity. So um, you can't just add a catalyst and turn a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction into spontaneous reaction. Right? It only affects the rate of the reaction. Do you guys remember what catalysts do exactly? It speeds up the reaction by lowering the activation energy. So if you guys remember that hump, it lowers that energy down, the transition state. Okay, so make sure you guys remember that, um, that chemical kinetics uh, will only affect the reaction rate. All right, do you guys remember this movie? Yeah. Happy Feet, one of my favorite movies. Uh, easy. This was, uh, I think it came out in 2005. Uh, I was still in, in high school. Anyways, uh, so this is Mumble, right? And um, he was in a class trying to learn how to sing, right? And the teacher was Miss Viola. And Miss Viola said that when you're learning how to sing, you have to, you have to be spontaneous. That's how she said it, right? And so the little penguin started singing. And when, when it was Mumble's turn, he couldn't sing. And so he just started uh, tapping his feet. And then Miss Viola was like, what are you doing, Mumble? And Mumble was like, I'm being spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really related to this topic, but I just thought that that was funny, spontaneous. All right, so let's talk about reversibility of processes, right? So any spontaneous process is considered irreversible, right? So that means you can't go both directions. You can only go in one direction. So if one direction, let's say forward reaction, is spontaneous, then the reverse reaction will be non-spontaneous, right? It will require energy, the reverse direction. So a reversible process will proceed back and forth between the two conditions any reversible, reversible process is considered at equilibrium, but one direction will be spontaneous and the opposite direction will be 
non-spontaneous. And any equilibrium uh, reactions results in no change in free energy. And we'll talk about Gibbs free energy um, with the symbol G later on, uh, maybe on Thursday. But you might want to remember that in an equilibrium reaction, the delta G is equivalent to zero. All right, so um, if a process is spontaneous in one direction, it must be non-spontaneous in the opposite direction. So for, for instance, let's say this brand new car right here. Over time, if you just leave it out, it'll turn into this junk, right? Because cars or metals are made of iron. And so um, if you expose it in air, oxygen will cause a redox reaction uh, forming rust. Right, iron oxide. And so it's spontaneous because it doesn't require energy. You just leave the car out or any metal, including iron, nail, or something, it will react with the oxygen in the air. And so it causes the formation of rust or iron oxide. But if you want to uh, turn this back to uh, a you know, brand new looking car, it will require energy. And that's why this is considered a non-spontaneous reaction or process going the other uh, direction. All right, another good example of a spontaneous process is aging, right? So uh, you can't reverse aging, unfortunately. It's only in movies. And so over time, we grow old and we die, okay? That's just the sad truth. I know. It's amazing. You know, science sometimes makes people sad. All right, do you guys have any questions regarding this uh, example or concept? Yeah, how does the paint slow down? Huh? The chemical process. Right, so again, there's always catalysts, right? Catalysts can speed up a reaction. Um, so some things could speed up aging. Probably sunlight. All right, here's another example. Diamonds, right? Over time, diamond will spontaneously turn into crap. Sorry, graphite. That's what I meant to say. Graphite. So graphite is the most stable form of carbon. And so every carbon-containing molecules out there will eventually turn into graphite, right? Something could, containing just a bunch of carbons. Dust, for example, will ever, you know, living creatures will someday turn into dust. So are diamonds unstable or is Diamond is stable, okay, but it's not as stable as graphite. So your diamond rings will eventually turn into graphite. You know, it may not take days or, you know, months or years, but it'll take probably thousands of years before it turns into graphite. So why does coal turn to diamond before it turns to graphite under pressure? So you can actually turn uh, carbons, any carbon-based molecules, into diamond, right? So that's how they create synthetic diamonds. So it is possible to go the opposite way. But the point here is that diamond turning to graphite is a spontaneous reaction. But you can go the opposite way which would be non-spontaneous because it requires energy. All right, spontaneous processes. Spontaneous processes occur because they release energy from the system. All right, so a lot of exothermic reactions are considered spontaneous because they have that uh, release of energy. So that happens when you have higher or reactants that are at higher uh, energy and products that are at a lower energy level. However, there are also endothermic reactions or processes that are spontaneous, okay? So even though they're consuming energy, okay, taking in energy, there's still gonna be a little bit of energy that's released overall. So there's a net release of energy. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. So how can something absorb potential energy yet have a net release of energy? And the answer is on the next slide. 
So here's an example, right, of an endothermic process. Melting is considered endothermic because it takes, it takes heat, right, to melt a solid. Okay. So melting is an endothermic process, yet ice will spontaneously melt above zero degrees Celsius. Remember that at zero degrees Celsius, you have equilibrium going on, right? So the rate of melting is equivalent to the rate of freezing. So at equilibrium at zero degrees, but uh, it says over here that above that temperature is zero degrees Celsius, then you have spontaneous uh, process, which is the melting part. But wouldn't there be energy going into the system at that point though? If it was above zero degrees Celsius, the energy would be heating. Right, so this is gonna be under certain conditions, right? So for example, right now at room temperature, if you put ice just out here, it'll start melting, right? even though you're not putting in any additional energy to it. Okay, so from no like, just like outside energy, not right. like, just like from the air. Right, so melting is considered spontaneous above zero degrees Celsius and non-spontaneous below zero degrees Celsius, okay? So when a solid melts, the particles have more freedom of movement and this freedom of movement or motion increases the randomness of that system. Right, and so we learned about entropy several chapters ago, and entropy is basically randomization, right, or the dispersal of energy or matter within a surrounding or a system. So any increase in the randomness increases entropy. So here's an example. Let's say solid ice, right, water, solid ice. Solid ice has a crystal structure, and so the atoms, or I'm sorry, yeah, the molecules, water molecules, are arranged in a very ordered manner, right, because it's a crystal structure. But when you melt that ice, then now the water molecules are all over the place, right? They're no longer in an ordered manner. So that increases entropy, and that release of entropy is uh, the reason why some endothermic processes are considered spontaneous. Right? Same thing from liquid to gas. So it's not just from solid to liquid, but also from liquid to gas. All right, so now let's move on to the second law of thermodynamics. So according to the second law of thermodynamics, any spontaneous process results in a positive value of delta S universe. Okay, so the entropy, the change in the entropy of the universe is positive for any spontaneous process. Okay, any processes that increase the entropy of the universe occur spontaneously and entropy itself is considered a state function. Do you guys remember what state function is? So you learned this uh, terminology in General Chemistry 1, uh, Chapter 6, Thermochemistry. Enthalpy is an example of a uh, state function. Temperature is also a step, state function. What does it mean exactly? So a state function means that we only care about the final state and the initial state. So basically the difference between the two, right? We don't care what's, what happened between uh, the two states or how you arrive at that state. So for example, let's say I have, let's say we have a mountain here, right? And the y-axis here is altitude. Right, and let's say that um, Mara right, wanted to climb the mountain, right? And she starts over here, so this is Mara, and right next to Mara is Daniel, right? So Daniel also wanted to try uh, to climb the mountain. All right, so Daniel um, went all the way up, straight up, Right, because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? So he just went up straight. But Mara took her time, right? So she traveled over here, walked over here, 
and then eventually she gets up there and meets Daniel, right? So the change in altitude, okay, altitude itself is a state function because we don't care how you arrive to that final stage, right? We only care about the difference, the initial height and the final height. As you can see, it doesn't matter what path you took to get to the you know, highest point. So delta H for Daniel is the same as the delta H for Mara. Okay. However, the energy, the energy here is not going to be a state function. So the energy that Mara took, right, or spent is a lot higher than the energy that Daniel spent to get to the top. How is Including time, huh? How is entropy considered a state function then? Because entropy as itself, you can't really directly quantify it per se, right? You can only quantify the difference. Okay. okay. Same thing with heat. So everyone, each object, they contain some form of heat, right? But but we can't really quantify that. So what we can quantify is the transfer of heat, the change in enthalpy, delta H. So it's the same idea here. All right, so here's a, um, so right, so delta S is equivalent to the final state or final entropy minus the initial entropy. Just, just letting you guys know that there shouldn't be uh, delta here. Okay, so it should be delta S equals Final to entropy minus initial entropy. So for a more disordered uh, system, the, the change in entropy will be positive. Okay? So for example, if your, uh, if your initial state was this one and you turn into this, right, then the change in entropy will be a positive number. But if it was the opposite direction, you're turning from a more disordered state into a less ordered state. Or I'm sorry, uh, what was that? So as I was saying, so if you were to move from a ordered system to a less ordered system, then the change in entropy is going to be positive, right? And from a uh, less ordered system to a more ordered system will give you a value that is negative, right? Delta is, is less than zero. All right. Do you guys have any questions regarding this slide? Okay. All right. So let's make a, uh, a quick transition here. So we'll focus on spontaneous and non-spontaneous reaction. Uh, there's actually two factors that will affect the spontaneity of a system or a chemical reaction. The first one is enthalpy change, delta H, right? So you learned in general chemistry one that delta H of a reaction is basically equivalent to the heat that was transferred, right, from one object to another or from the chemical reaction itself to the surrounding, the water. Right, and this is true at constant pressure. Okay, so it says over here that the enthalpy change delta H is the difference in the sum of internal energy and uh, work energy of the reactants to the product. So uh, delta H, here's another form of this equation, is equal to delta E plus work, which is. P times delta V. So you guys remember that equation, right? If you've taken physics, it's probably a different uh, convention, but it's the same idea. Right? And the other factor here is the change in entropy. Okay, so the entropy change delta S is the difference in randomness of the reactants compared to the products. So the point of the slide is you have to remember that there are two factors. That would be change in the enthalpy and the change in entropy. Um, I know the delta H, yeah, I think both of these are okay. in the formula sheet. <coughs> yeah. 
All right, so this entropy, this one is a little bit more advanced and I was kind of surprised that they uh, included it in this textbook. But entropy, so this is the very definition of entropy in terms of thermodynamics, right? So entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases with the number of energetically equivalent ways of arranging the components of a system to achieve a particular state. So it's kind of advanced um, definition. So entropy was studied by this scientist named Boltzmann. Like the constant? Right, exactly, like the constant, Boltzmann. Right, so he came up with this equation for entropy, right? Not the change of entropy, but S itself, entropy. Okay? So S is equivalent to the Boltzmann constant K times the natural log of W. And W here is the number of equivalent ways that you can arrange um, the components within a system. So W is considered unitless. Boltzmann constant K is not the same as the rate constant K. All right, so K here has a value. It's 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd. And the units are joules per kelvins. So let's say we have four different states here, right? A, B, and C, and these are called macro states. Okay, let's say state A, you can have uh, four, four gas molecules per vessel, right, per flask. State B, you can have four gas molecules, also per flask, but it's gonna be on the right-hand side of the flask, right? And for state C, you can have two um, molecules, gas molecules on each side. So looking at state A, how many different uh, arrangements can you make for state A? Right, that's equivalent, basically. Can you rearrange this uh, into another way in which it's similar to the original? Only once, right? So same thing for state B. But for state C, you can rearrange these gas molecules uh, more than one arrangement. So what I mean by this is shown here on the next slide. Um, so which state do you think has the greatest number of energetically equivalent ways? That would be state C. And let me show you how. All right, so if you have state C here, right, and each flask contains oops, four slots, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And we'll call, we'll number these slots. One, two, three, and four. Same thing here, one, two, three, and four. So you can have a combination of one and two, right? And three and four. Or you can also have this combination, one, three, and two, four combination, right? So that means that you can have multiple different ways that you can arrange these gas molecules and would still have the same number of atoms, right? Two on each side. Does that make sense? So in total, we can have a total of six different arrangements. All right, so the number of arrangements is equivalent to the W. So the higher the value of the W, the greater the value of S. Okay. Here's another example. All right, let's say we have two different systems, system A and system B. So if you look at system A, the total energy here is four joules, right, because each atom in system A contains two joules. So this contains two joules plus two joules, and you get a total of four joules. For system B, the same thing, right? You have a total of four joules. This one is one joule right here, plus three joules. You also get a total of four. Is there another way 
you can arrange system A. Not really, right? Because you only have one energy level here, here that's available. Oh, so this is, this is all in relation to, the, to those energy levels then? Right, it's, it's rela related to the energy levels. So, but for system B, you can swap the positions of the two atoms, right? You can have the blue one here and the red one on this side, right? And when you add up the, the two uh, atoms' energy, it's still going to be four joules. So system B has a second microstate, right? Second uh, possible arrangement. And so the total W for system B is going to be two. And for system A, it's just going to be one. So that means the system B has a higher entropy than system A. Does that make sense? So for example, let's say I have two pockets here, right? How many different ways can I put this pen in my pocket? Two. Two. But if I'm wearing a blazer, I'll have several more pockets. So I can put this in this pocket here, right here, so on and so forth. Right. So there's so many different ways you can do it. If there are pockets in really well, you can put them in sideways. Like. But you get the point. Yes. Okay. I'm just being careful. So that means uh, system B has a greater entropy. All right, so in this slide, I just summarize it in this little box right here. All right, so uh, when materials change state, the number of macrostates, it can have changes as well. So we're just gonna summarize all of this statement right here into this box. So if there's a physical change from a solid to a liquid, you will have a positive change in entropy, okay? So from solid to liquid is positive. Solid to gas is also positive. From liquid to gas, positive. And finally, the increase in the number of moles of gas in the chemical reaction will also give you a positive change in entropy. Right? The reason why is because liquids, <coughs> compared to uh, solids, will have higher um, entropy. Right? The randomness for liquids is greater than it is for solids because solids have crystal structure, they're more ordered, right? So if you're switching from a solid to a liquid, then you'll get a positive delta S, okay? and so on and so forth. So let's look at an example. So let's say, since we talked about combustion reaction, uh, we're burning fuel, right? And the main component of gasoline is which organic compound? Do you guys remember? Which organic compound is the main component of gasoline? Carbon. It's carbon-based, yeah. So what is it? Which one? I mean, there's so many carbon-based molecules. Methane. Yeah. Carbon so whenever you're gassing up, there's like a rating, right? What does that say? Octane, right? So the main component is octane. And octane contains eight carbons, octa, right? So it's C, 8, H, 18, and a combustion reaction requires presence of oxygen. And the product of a combustion reaction is always going to be carbon dioxide and water. Is this a balanced chemical reaction? No. No. So how do we balance this? What are you doing with my eight more carbon on the right-hand side? All right, so I'll put a coefficient eight here in front of carbon dioxide. So that's balanced for carbon. Okay, um, let's go with the easy one here, hydrogen. Okay. Put, nine. put nine, all right, so we'll put a coefficient of nine. So that balances hydrogen, and now we can count oxygen. So eight times two is six, plus nine, 25. All right, but on the left-hand side, we only have two. So how do we balance that? Right, so you can do half. Yeah, exactly. So we can do 25 over 2, right? A fraction okay. in front of... I don't know you can do that. You can't do a fraction, but you, you can use this as an initial uh, step, right? So how do you get rid of the fraction? Multiply, Multiply the entire thing by 2. So now you have uh, 2C8H18 plus 25O2. 
8 times 216 carbon dioxide plus 18 water molecules. So when you're counting the total number of moles, right, on each side, the reactants have a total of 27 moles, right? From 27 moles to 18 plus 16 is 34, right? So that's an increase in the number of moles, right, from 27 to 34. And so according to this statement right here, the delta S of this chemical reaction is positive. So the increase in the, in the number of moles will be the positive thing. Right. All right, and this graph right here, this diagram just illustrates uh, the entropy change and state change, right? So if, you're, uh, if there's a physical state change from solid to liquid, then you would have a positive delta S, and from liquid to gas will also be positive. All right, let's look at an example here. Predict the sign of delta S for each process. So vapor to liquid water. It would be negative because this is a um, gas to liquid transition, right? So this gives you a delta S of a negative delta S. Okay. What about B? Solid carbon dioxide sublimes. What does sublimation mean? From going from a solid to a vapor, or, right? Right, so from solid directly to gas state, yeah. So from solid to gas, which is sublimation, would it be positive or negative? Right, it's going to be positive because this is from solid directly to gas. The gas is more disordered compared to solid. And the last one here. It would also be passed positive because we have two moles, right? Two moles on the left turning into three moles. All right, so the delta S here is also positive. All right, so um, another concept here. So now how do we quantify, right? So the math comes in. How do we quantify delta S, the change in entropy? I thought we couldn't. The change, you can. Oh, okay, okay, the change. Yeah. So we can define the change in entropy that occurs when a system exchanges a quantity of heat with its surroundings at a constant temperature using this equation. So uh, whenever we say constant temperature, we use this terminology called, uh, called isothermal, okay? So anyone here majoring in chemistry? Well, chemical engineering. Okay, so you're probably going to take higher level chemistry courses like physical chemistry, mm -hmm. thermodynamics and stuff like that. So you'll learn, you'll be using isothermal a lot more, uh, isobaric and all the other uh, types. Yeah related to thermochemistry. All right, so um, delta S here, the units are joules per Kelvin. Okay, so energy divided by temperature. Q here is going to be the heat that's exchanged between systems or transferred from one object to another, right? So you, if you remember from general chemistry one, Q is equivalent to mass times the specific heat of the substance times delta T, right? So this is similar to this, except this is heat for a reversible process, REV, reversible. All right, and then you divide that by temperature, and temperature has to be in Kelvins, okay? So how do you convert degrees Celsius to Kelvins again? Plus 273. 
we just add 273. All right, let's take a look at this example right here. Calculate the change in entropy delta S that occurs in the system when 25 grams of water is converted from gas to liquid at its boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius. So it also gives you the delta H of vaporization, which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So my first question here is, what exactly is delta H of vaporization? What does it mean? Right, it's the amount of energy in terms of heat, right, uh, to um, vaporize the liquid. Is that viscosity or osmosis? Uh, I think it's both. Yeah. So we also talked about this in chapter 11. All right, what would be the first step here? What do you guys suggest? What is that formula again? So you want to start with the formula. Okay, so delta S equals Q rev, reversible process, divided by temperature. Okay. So you're given delta H of vaporization. So if you guys remember that delta H is basically equivalent to heat, right, at constant pressure. So your delta H here then, vaporization, is equal to Q rev. Is that right? So remember that delta H of vaporization is the energy required to vaporize a liquid, turn it into gas, right? Over here it says, calculate delta S when water condenses from a gas to liquid. So we're gonna reverse this, right? So delta H of vaporization is equal to the negative delta H of condensation. So it's the condensation that we need here. Okay, so in that case, our Q rev is equal to the negative delta H vaporization. Okay, so all you have to do now is plug it in to this equation here. So negative 40.7 kilojoules per mole divided by temperature, which is 100 degrees Celsius plus 273, you get 373 kelvins. Okay. But remember that the unit for delta S is joules per kelvin. If you want, you can just leave it in kilojoules. But we need to get rid of that number of moles here. How do we get rid of it? There's another piece of information here that we haven't used yet. The grams of water. Grams of water. So you can convert grams of water to moles of water. Right? So we have 25 grams of water. Convert this to number of moles. So we use molar mass of water, which is 18. 18 grams per mole. All right, so grams would cancel, leaving you with number of moles, which is should be around 1.3, 1.39. All right, so we're just gonna multiply delta H of vaporization by 1.39 moles. And we get negative 0 0.152 kilojoules per Kelvin. In a kilojoule, it's a thousand joules, right? I have a it's a thousand joules. Concept. All right, do you guys have any questions regarding this example? Is there a reason that Q rev equals delta 
teach math? Like, what's this? Is that just something that's known? Or? No, because we're looking at the heat that was transferred, mm -hmm. right? And the delta H of vaporization is not equivalent exactly to QRev, right? There's that negative sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that your answer to your question? Not really. Like what I'm not, like what I'm trying to say is like how do we know that QRev is equal to negative delta H factors? Is it because of this, right? So delta H of the change in enthalpy is equivalent to heat that was transferred mm -hmm. between two systems. Mara? So you would know that it's negative also from, like, say that it goes from a gas to a liquid. Right, it's the reverse. If it was liquid to gas, then that's delta H of vaporization, right? You're vaporizing the liquid. But if it's gas back to liquid, then you need delta H of condensation, which is usually the reverse, the, the exact number as delta H vap, which is different sign. So I'm going to pause this. All right, so I'll probably have three more slides here and we'll call it a day. All right, recall that for any spontaneous process or reaction, we have delta S universe positive, okay? It's greater than zero. So for any, so if we want delta S universe to be positive, right? And we get a delta S system that is negative then in order for the delta S universe to be a positive value, delta S of surrounding has to be a greater number, right, in magnitude and a positive value, according to this equation. So delta S of universe is equivalent to the delta S of the system plus delta S of the surrounding. So if this is a small negative number, this has to be a big positive number for delta S universe to be spontaneous. Or positive. Okay. So an exothermic process increases the delta S of the surrounding, and an endothermic process decreases the delta S of surrounding. So based on this statement, how 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 is it that an exothermic process results in the increase of delta S surrounding? Right, so the randomness increases, right. right? You're putting in more energy, energy gets dispersed into the surroundings, and so... I think, yeah, like, and, I think like fire, so it's gonna, like, move all the particles. And the right, so entropy increases. But for endothermic process, you're taking in energy from the outside surrounding, right? So that would decrease the delta S of the surrounding. All right, so... Let's look at this one example here. Um, let's take a look at the dependence, temperature dependence of the surroundings, delta S of surroundings. Is the freezing of water considered spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Non-spontaneous. Freezing well, of depends. water. It depends, actually. It on depends the, on? The temperature of the air. Right. Sure. It says it right here, right? It has temperature dependence. You are correct. Um, what about at zero degrees Celsius? Freezing of water, would that be spontaneous or non-spontaneous? We're at equilibrium, so... There you go, you guys are learning, yes. It's at equilibrium, and so there's not, it's neither spontaneous or non-spontaneous. But above zero degrees Celsius, above zero degrees Celsius, it's going to be non-spontaneous. Right? Because it requires energy to freeze it back down to below zero. But below zero degrees Celsius, then you have a spontaneous freezing. All right, so it is non-spontaneous non above zero. The increase in the delta S of surrounding is temperature dependent. The higher the temperature, the lower the amount of entropy for a given amount of energy dispersed. So this is related to... The equation, right? Delta S equals uh, heat divided by T. So as you increase the value of T, the value of delta S decreases.
All right, so we have a new uh, equation here. This time it's um, in terms of the surrounding, delta S of surrounding. Okay, so delta S of surrounding is equivalent to the negative delta H of the system, right? Enthalpy of the system divided by temperature.